Okay, first question. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm just curious as to why you, like, how do you substantiate uh, an anecdotal evidence being superior to a standard of evidence held by the scientific method? I see. Well, you know what? I'm afraid I'm, I'm not substantiating either. What I'm here to suggest to you is that in my life experience, the authoritative word of God became the guide to faith in life. And that if you haven't read the Word of God or have felt perhaps like I, that it was just inflammatory and offensive, my only suggestion to you is that you read it. So it's simply in a, it's a, think of, it as, think of this as a favorite book sharing. Yeah, Rosaria is here to say, you know, what's your favorite book? The Bible. And if you haven't read it, there's a lot of free ones there. Well, I guess what I, was, what I would say... One question, please. Next question. I have too many people here. I'll talk to you in the, book sh in the bookstore tomorrow. Next. Anyone else? Uh, first of all, thank you for sharing your story. Thank um, you. But I wonder, what is your opinion of the statistics regarding conversion that show significantly higher rates of suicide and depression? I'm sorry. Conversion of what? What are you talking about? Conversion from, uh, to Christianity and f converting yourself from gay to straight. Well, first of all, there's no conversion from gay to straight. The only conversion that is relevant in the Bible is the conversion of a heart that was at enemy with God to a heart that is at peace with God. And what God does... <laughs> So let me just make something very clear here. The, the Christian uh, answer to the issue of homosexuality is not heterosexuality. It is holiness. And you know what? The church hasn't always gotten that one right, has it? So let me tell you what conversion is, because it's a train wreck and it wasn't fun. It is total annihilation, and anyone who is a Christian had to give up everything. And what God gives you back is up to him. And you know what? Some people have a harder cross to bear. And I want to suggest this to the Christians in this audience. For people who are struggling with same-sex attraction and who are faithful believers in Jesus Christ, please do not take the cross that they bear and make it heavier. Because you know what? Homosexuality is a sin, but so is homophobia. Amen. And you know what? I would like to suggest that we love the sinner and hate our own sin. Next question. Next question, please. Um, I have a question about... Um, you've said before that a practicing Christian cannot be a practicing homosexual, and vice versa. I said that in my talk tonight? Well, no, but in prior talks and stuff. That a practicing I've Christian cannot be a practicing homosexual? Yeah. Would you like me to some sort something of work similar. that one out a little bit? Yes. Okay, please. let me work that out. And you know what, that's a good... There, these are really hard questions, and you are asking really good questions, because it's making all of us um, define our terms, and that's important. What I have said... And what I believe is that repentance is the ground zero of the Christian life. Christians will struggle, and do struggle if we're honest about it, with all manner of sin and temptation. Temptation is actually not sin, though. Temptation is temptation. What you do with temptation might tell me a lot, and you a lot, about sin. But ultimately, it is the Holy Spirit in kindness that brings about the fruit and the gift of repentance. Um, I can't repent of a sin without God giving me the gift of faith to do that. And so that's quite frankly what is, there are many things that are wrong with reparative therapy. There are many things that are wrong with taking someone struggling with same-sex attraction and saying, you need to change. You need to be different. And, and one of the most offensive things is that it, it forgets that it's only a holy God that gives people the faith or the desire in the first place. 
You know, people don't do that. Believe me, I am a homeschool mom. My real people are four feet tall. If I could change anybody, you know, I would change them. I am fundamentally un, you know, incapable of doing that. So what I have said before is that you cannot be unrepentingly defending a personal right to anything in the Bible that explicitly stands against the Word of God. Now, here's the argument, though. Let me, let me suggest that the place where we, I think, need to frame this is that there are some of us in this, word, in this, in this room who believe that the Word of God is inerrant and it's inspired. And, and maybe we don't, some of us don't know what those words mean, so let me tell you. To be inspired is to have a holy origin. And to be inerrant is to be trustworthy and true. So there are many in this room who believe that that's true about the Word of God. And then there are others in this room who do not believe that that is true about the Word of God, who believe that there are problems or concerns in, in some of those passages. It seems to me that it would make more sense to um, argue at that level than other places, because at, you cannot, we are never going to agree on the the sum of a problem if we don't agree with the terms of the problem. Okay, next question. No, next question. I'll be in a coffee shop tomorrow. Okay. Um, you can take the professor out of the classroom, but you cannot take the classroom out of the professor. Uh, to any LGBTQ plus person struggling with your gender and or sexual identity or considering suicide, you are enough, beautiful, and perfect exactly the way you are, and I ineffably love you. Hi, um, I, I am assuming that your opposition to homosexuality is based on the Bible, um, but do you also support the death penalty for it? Because it says in Leviticus 20, 13, that they should be I'm killed. I'm so if they are. glad you asked that question. And it also says that I am never to wear wool and cotton together. And you know what? I am wearing my yoga pants. I got all dressed up for tonight. <laughs> I am wearing my yoga pants and I am in complete violation of the ceremonial word of God. But you want to hear the good news? In the Old Testament, the ceremonial law went out with the old temple sacraments. In the Old Testament, the judicial law was ref was made ref was making reference to the old um, the old nation of Israel and the only part of the Old Testament that has relevance for a conversation about this is the moral law and that is where you find the admonitions against any sexual sin and you know what I don't happen to think homosexuality is you know the the biggest issue that we're facing I'm sorry I, I just don't. But that is where you find it. Now, why do we read the Old Testament? Why do I read the ceremonial law and the judicial law? Because it gives you a good sense of the character of a holy God and his love of holiness. All right, next question. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing very well. How are you? Very good, very good. And who um, are you? I'm doing good. Okay, well, what's your name? Uh, my name is Luke Blankenship. Oh, I'm president good. of Pride Alliance. Luke, we're going to talk tomorrow, right? Oh, we most certainly are. Okay, very good. <laughs> And you uh, all will be there. Uh, all right, excellent. Uh, I'd just like to, to piggyback off a comment that Heather said during her question, and I'd like to ask you a question. Is that okay? That is perfectly fine. Okay. Um, I've seen a lot of your YouTube videos, and one of your Q&As, somebody asked that a similar question about can you be a practicing Christian and a practicing homosexual, and this was your answer. Uh, to answer your question, someone who can be a Christian who struggles with homoerotic desires, yes. Can someone be a Christian who claims the Bible is not true and that homosexuality is a viable, a viable alternative? No, because the Jesus whom we commit our lives is um, inseparable to the word. Jesus is a Logos word made flesh. So you have said in the past that you cannot be a practicing homosexual and a practicing Christian. I just want to get that out there just so that everybody can know. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm going to still okay. go with that. I'm not quite sure. My, my question here is um, the American Medical Association, the American Psychiatric Association, the American Psychological Association, the American Association for Marriage and Family Therapy, the American Counseling Association, the National Association for Social Workers, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the National Association of School Psychologists, and the American Academy of Physician Assistants all say that suppressing 
not conversion, but suppressing sexuality is in fact very damaging. How does your faith combat the exper expertise of all these qu organizations? Well, God made, well, let me clap for Luke. Go clap for Luke. Here's the only answer that I can give you. God made you and God takes care of you. So I am appealing to a higher authority. It is a different authority. It, it is not a civil, I understand that, but it is a higher authority. God made the world, and God redeemed the world, and I believe that. Okay, but we'll talk tomorrow, right, Luke? All right, excellent. Are you going to buy me coffee? Okay, excellent. I'm not sitting there for hours without a cup of coffee, a good cup of coffee. Okay, excellent. Hi, Mrs. Butterfield, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you. Good. Um... I don't know where to begin, but I identify as an Italian-American, a, uni a University of South Florida Bull, and I, also, and I am also a Christian. Okay. And you were saying in your speech something about to the effect that uh, while you were through your conversion, that you woke up and you still felt like a lesbian. Mm -hmm. um, that is only a small part of who you were. Did you just let that specifically define you? Um, are you asking if I let my sexual identity define me at a certain point in my life? Is that primarily what you're, I'm sorry. I, through your speech? From yeah. what my understanding, yeah. you let that. Well, you know, part I did. I think you. I did. I think I did let a. a um, but I. But I didn't think of it as a small part. I, I really didn't. I, f I felt that it was a, um, a defining identity. Um, and I, I don't. I don't know if I let it define me. I mean, I was a. Um, but I, I suppose I did. I suppose I did. It was, it was a defining identity, absolutely. I'm an Italian American also, as you probably figured, with a name like Rosaria, right? Yeah, I guess. Okay. Rosaria down here. Oh, I'm sorry. The There's other a second mic over here. I don't there know is. Know. Look. <laughs> wow. Okay. Great. Hi. Um, Let me come this way then. Hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Rayma. It's nice Rayma. to meet you, ma'am. Uh, your belief that homosexuality and Christianity are not able to coexist has been the root of discrimination against LGBT people everywhere. In fact, anyone who associates with the LGBT community will be treated differently by any person basically on any given day. So how do you, with that in mind, how do you feel about having people leave this lecture and look at me and treat me as less of a person without knowing my sexuality or my um, religion or mm -hmm. really my stance on the entire issue. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, don't, um, I don't defend or support discrimination of any kind, but what I am advocating here, back to the what's your favorite book, Rosaria, mm -hmm. I'm advocating that we all spend some time reading the Bible, and you know what? working out for ourselves these identity issues because in my understanding of the bible and this really shifted i, I you know I, I did embrace and I, a, a, you know almost a imbalanced i think someone might have been suggesting lesbian identity but one of the things i've discovered in reading the bible and you know here's the here's the challenge about reading and you all know this if you don't read it you can't really you can't really come to the table on it. So, so I want you to read it for a couple of reasons. It's my favorite book. I mentioned that. And this is Rosaria's favorite book night. But also, you were created. Every single person in this room was created with an abiding identity. And that is a soul that will last forever. You know, there's no marriage in heaven. Do you know that? We're all going to be single in heaven. I mean, has anybody ever thought about that? I, I don't know. I think we need to think about that. So, so, what is your soul identity? So that's my, my suggestion, is that you read that Bible and you work that out. Other questions. But I will be in a coffee shop tomorrow. Again, other questions. Yes. Good evening, Dr. Butterfield. Okay, so I think you probably alluded to this, and I've heard a lot of other people say this, but... I'm uh, sorry, can you speak more slowly and sorry. into that? There you go. Well, good evening. Um, I've heard a lot of people say this, um, and say that the Bible often creates more questions than answers, and mm -hmm. a lot of people will agree. Um, it seems like the Bible leaves a lot out. 
how are you sure what the Bible says about homosexuality applies to uh, what we consider homosexuality in a contemporary setting? Obviously, the Bible hasn't mentioned a lot about um, any of the other identities, such as, you know, let's say, asexuals or people with differing gender identities that are outside of the uh, binary. Yeah. If they left those yeah. people out, then how did we know that they made room for what we consider, you know, a contemporary monogamous, you know, or sure. even polyamorous homosexual relationship? Sure, that's right. That's a good question. That's a good question. <laughs> and it raises, you know, part of why this is such a powerful question and powerful problem is that in this room, some of us are really wrong and some of us are really right. And you know what? I don't think... I. You know, one of my prayers for myself as I speak to groups is that I will not be sinning against you. Mm. All right, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm sincere in that. So, but, but, but here's what I go back to, and, and you don't have to, to agree with me, and I don't know if other people in this room may. I think that when we're reading the Bible, we need to read, we need to compare scripture to scripture. So we can't just take a Bible verse, you know, out of the blue and make it, make it more important than what it is, or, or it reinterpret it. So we need to compare scripture with scripture. But the other thing we need to do is we need to read the Bible, you know, just as, as you would in some ways any other book, in the context of who wrote it. And um, back to the presuppositions, a holy God, a holy and a good God, a holy and a good and a sovereign God, a holy and a good and a sovereign and a timeless God would not create a book that was so flawed that it would just condemn for the purpose of condemning a people group. And you know, there's nothing, there's never a time in the Bible where people are um, accused or condemned or held accountable without being offered a gift of grace. Okay. But again, I mean, I just want to go back to this. I don't think that gift of grace means that heterosexuality is the solution to homosexuality. I think that, and, and maybe this gets to some of your binarism, your, your, binar, your binarism um, observation, that we, um, we uh, are at fault for making um, a, aggressive, maybe, uh, interpretations of other people in those ways. Okay, next question. Is there someone here? Yes. Hi, um, Hi. I'm Rebecca. Hi, Rebecca. Um, I was wondering how the Christian community can better love the LGBT community. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know what? Meet me in the coffee shop, because Luke is going to be there, and he's going to tell us. Because, you know, no, one good way that you can love people is to listen to them. So a very good way that the Christian community can uh, love the LGBT community is to listen. Well, I, th I suppose some mutual listening would be a good thing, yes. I'm all for that. <coughs> Guys, I only have three hours in a coffee shop tomorrow. I don't live in Tampa, I live in Durham. <laughs> you know? Next question. Hi. Um, Hi. I have people anxiety, so I apologize if I can't words. I'm sorry, you have... I'm nervous, so I apologize if I can't wear it, so I'm shaking. I'm not nervous. <laughs> I'm nervous, too. <laughs> <laughs> um, you brought up earlier the Romans quote, and mm -hmm. I've always heard that um, in discussion about homosexuality and Christianity, and the first thing I hear is the Romans quote, and Romans 1 condemns them because they went against their nature, and I believe it's a sin to go against your nature, heterosexuals are engaging in same-sex relations and going against their nature, but by this reasoning, I believe that if a lesbian or a gay person goes against their nature and they engage in op opposite gender sexual behavior, I believe that's also sinning. And God created, God created us in his image, and I thank you for coming here and talking to us, and I hope that you do reach out to people and Personally, as a lesbian who grew up as a Catholic, and I went through that stage of hating myself, praying to God, and I'm not that religious affiliated now. I'm more Hindu, if anything, now. This is my journey, and I know God created me in my image, and I respect you, everyone here, all different beliefs. And You did great. You were yes. fine. You did, you did not. Okay. Um, 
When we talked about comparing scripture with scripture, Romans 1 just can't stand on its own. And, and I would think that everyone here agrees that vocabulary matters, right? What words we use to describe ourselves and other people matter. And, but you know what? It matters to God, too. It, it, it matters to a holy God how we define human nature. And, and actually, Romans 1 doesn't define human nature. It just uses the term you get to a definition of human nature in Genesis. And that's where, and you can disagree with this, I am not suggesting that you're going to agree with me, but if you just want to know sort of how I arrived at that place, um, it's through something called a creation ordinance uh, in, in Genesis 2. That God created male and female. And you know, those words have been used against me too, and so I don't, I don't share those um, with out a sense of the, the difficulty of that. But that is the definition of, of a sexual and human nature that Romans 1 is uh, depending upon. But thank you for asking that question, and you were not nervous, and I didn't even hear your voice rattle even a teeny bit, so that was great. Next question. Uh, this question may uh, be outside of the tenor. Of uh, much of the dis much of the uh, the questions discussion previous to this, um, but seeing as the the discussion or the or the or the presentation has been uh, presented uh, to some degree for better or worse as um, a kind of book discussion, uh, is there a particular favored translation of this right. sacred text uh -huh. that you affect? Um, was there a question? Or is that just a comment? That, that, is there a particular translation that you like? Oh, is there a particular enjoy? translation that I read? I like to read the NASB. That's, my, that's what I'm reading right now. Although I like to read the Bible through many times in a year, and I like to read through different translations, but what I like about the NASB and what I like about the New King James is I'm a student of poetry, and I really love metrical poetry and I have I'm 51 and so my brain is starting to you know over the years get a little squishy and what I love about metrical poetry is it, it it's easier to memorize and remember because it has a meter to it so that's what I like should we be equitable here and let this hello my name is Joshua I Hi, actually Joshua. went through uh, sexual therapy and conversion therapy um, sorry if my voice cracks. <laughs> um, early in my life for quite a few years, including biblical counseling, can you um, elaborate more on why you think that's not the proper way to go about it? Uh, well, the way that reparative therapy has been used in the past um, often has been, uh, this is how it's been used. And, and, I, and I, you know, I, I hadn't, it hadn't occurred to me that, of course, um, you know, I know that there are some good examples from it as well, but often it was used to see the, to again, um, superimpose a heterosexuality upon a person who really didn't want that. You know, again, I, I just newsflash, it, it, the Bible tells me that it's better to be single. I, I don't know what else to say. You know, G God did not reveal his son in me to make me a lovely wife and mother. Okay, it's way bigger than that. And so what I'm con what, what's uncomfortable to me about reparative therapy is that it, 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 it tended to have this, um, I think, very this world solution, not an eternal solution. You know, God is pleased with all whose lives are committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. But that commitment is you can't chop up Jesus. You know, it's, it's the Jesus of the Bible. So that's my, my concern. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Uh, thanks for coming tonight. I really enjoyed the speech. Um, sort of going on the, uh, your favorite books theme, mm -hmm. uh, C.S. Lewis said something brilliant, like uh, an atheist has to be very careful in his reading so he doesn't lapse into belief or something, like, something <laughs> along those lines. Uh, so are there any other sort of uh, sidebar readings that you would recommend uh, also for someone who's seeking? Sidebar readings, yes. You know, a, a book that I really love um, is by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. It's called Life Together. Um, I, I think that the ground zero of the Christian life is hospitality. And hospitality means love of the stranger. 
And so I love to read books in uh, Christian hospitality and to think through some of those things. And Life Together was written in part to talk about what hospitality is like under persecution, right? Where it just becomes really important. So I would recommend that book to you. Absolutely. I also read a lot of fiction and I recommend everybody needs to read the 1818 edition of Frankenstein. No, I'm serious. I'm serious. I'm totally serious. It's an excellent, excellent novel. I'm serious! Oh, you want to hold it? Okay. Hi, doctor. Hi. I want to be very careful not to phrase my compliment as a question because I don't want to use it my only question. Okay. <laughs> We're with you, brother. <laughs> I think it's very admirable that you made it very clear, and I think I, I understood you correctly, that you genuinely feel that homosexuality is wrong and you equally feel that being homophobic is equally wrong. That both are a sin and not consistent with the spirit that we are taught. And is that your comment or your question? All right. That was my, that was, I just wanted to be clear okay. on that. I, I thought it was very admirable because I know that's lost a lot of times on people. Um, so that I'm clear about your perspective on conversion therapy, you don't recognize that as legitimate because you think the starting point, correct me if I'm wrong, but you don't think the starting point is someone is gay. You think the starting point is they are made in God's image, not gay. Well, yeah, I'm uncomfortable with looking at, with, with, with um, again, um, pathologizing right. homosexuality. And, and the reason is because we are all born in original sin. Right. So, you know, guess what, newsflash? We are all born that way, whatever that way is. And you know what? Sin always feels good. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sorry to report that, but if your sin doesn't feel good, you are not doing it right, and you need <laughs> some help. Okay? You need some real, serious help. And I am not going to talk about that at the coffee shop tomorrow, but you got to think that one through. So, I am, you know, I'm... You're funny. You're a funny group. I don't know. Um, but, so, but, but the other reason is that therapy cannot produce repentance. You know, the Bible talks about repentance unto life. It, it does not talk about therapy unto life. And, and, and repentance is a gift from God. And it is done in the kindness of the Holy Spirit. And you simply cannot manufacture that. That is not a widget that I can make or you can make. Now, obviously, God can use all kinds of therapies. But yes, I'm uncomfortable with the starting point because it pathologizes homosexuality and acts as though that is somehow a unique issue. It's certainly not a unique issue in my life, and it's not a unique issue in the Bible because we are all born that way, whatever that way means. I know you got one question, I, and you don't look like you're going to be at the coffee shop with me tomorrow. I'm so not you're. Be able to make it, and, I, and I really don't want to ask a second question. I just want a little bit more clarification. So your feeling is that because of your personal beliefs, homosexuality is against God, but so is homophobia, so is dishonesty, yeah, so yeah. is a long list of things. Right, and I wouldn't. I mean, again. Back to my favorite book. You know, the big challenge with this book, the Bible, is that it really does have a, um, an origin and a progeny unlike all others. And so I, I wouldn't necessarily, I don't think that I'm offering a, um, a I, I, you know, I'm sharing with you my faith journey based upon the inerrant inspired word of God. And I don't mean that as some sneaky little raid. Do you know what I mean by that? Because I've seen those. I've been at the I've been at the receiving end of those those sneaky little raids where people, um, you know, kind of come in with their worldview and then leave without ever giving you a chance to to offer an alternative. So yes, you know, this is my my story. This is my story. But you know what? And I'm so glad for this. The truth of the gospel does not depend upon my story. What makes the gospel true has nothing to do with me. It's something that in the word of God we can palpably embrace. I want you to be at that coffee shop tomorrow, I, I wish think. I could. I th well, okay, well tell Luke what I need to hear. 
Luke, you're taking notes, right? Are you still here? Okay. Hi, he Dr. Left. Um, <laughs> during the abolitionist movement, many, many proponents of slavery would argue that the New Testament mm -hmm. condoned slavery, and they right. would quote Paul. And right. obviously, the Bible got that wrong. And yes. I was just. Yes, that's right. My question, though, is do you ever feel that the Bible could also have gotten homosexuality wrong, considering it got slavery wrong? Well, the Bible's gotten all kinds of things wrong, right? I mean, that's, that's why I started reading the Bible. My question was how did this book get so many well meaning people off track? Um, but you're, you're absolutely right that the, the, there's uh, examples of chattel slavery in the Old Testament as an example, uh, you know, as a, as, a, as a proof of what actually happened. But in Ephesians 6.5, when Paul talks about slaves being obedient to your masters, you know, that's a real interesting section, and I, I really had to study that one. Um, and you know, it was, it was, it was uh, really painful for me, I will tell you, when I was studying it, because I learned that in the context of the first century Roman slaves, that indeed a Roman slave in the first century had about the same liberties as a graduate student. I'm so sorry to tell you that. Okay, um, and so, and as a professor at the time who had a number of graduate students working under her, it, I, I did not want to see myself, you know, in that way. Um, but you are right, uh, the Bible did get that wrong. And yes, I am concerned. I think any time we say, thus saith the Lord, uh, we want to be careful. Um, and that is why I encourage you to pick up one of those free books, not mine, because mine isn't the mine isn't the favorite book, you know, right? The Bible, and read it for yourself. You know, that if, if there's if there's a takeaway from tonight, it's that your soul matters, and you cannot. There are a lot of things in life you can delegate to people, right? I mean, I delegate all the time. This is the one thing that you cannot delegate. It is precious and it is yours. So read the Bible and you know what? Decide for yourself. And you're not going to read it in time for our conversation tomorrow in the coffee shop, but I will probably let you know how to reach me after that and you can let me know what you think. Because I can't think for you and you can't think for me. But it's a responsibility that you have. No, you're going to have to meet me in the coffee shop. You don't even have a microphone. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, I, um, my name is Anthony DeRossi. <clears throat> uh, I just wanted to, you touched on it before, the question of um, can you be a, a practicing Christian mm -hmm. um, and a practicing homosexual? Mm -hmm. um, in my, my ethics class that I took uh, at school, I thought it was particularly helpful um, when we were discussing the difference between homosexual and homoerotic. Yes. So I, I was wondering yes. if you could just touch on that for the sake I of discussion. Agree. So thank you. Yeah, well, you took the class. You might have more to say on and that. And I just um, want to thank you for your dedication and courage in the scriptures. Uh, thank so. you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm so glad. You know, there is actually no sin that I can see against temptation. In fact, I think we're told that Jesus is tempted in all ways. The, the issue is what do you do with your temptation? And so that's that line. That's that line. And that's again why I have some concerns with reparative therapy. Because I don't believe, again, I believe that the Bible does say it's better to be single and I believe that there are many, many people who by choice or circumstance will choose a single celibate life as an honor and testimony to God. Who's next? Hi, um, I, uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm really nervous too. Um, I grew up a Christian, um, I'm straight, um, but I kind of found out, um, through a weird series of events, I found out my aunt was gay, I met a lot of gay people, I met a lot of lesbians, and I made friends with them, and I kind of realized that it's not, how I grew up, it was, it was taught to me as, like, the worst thing that you could ever do. Right. And, I kind of just wanted to know how you can see homosexuality as a worse sin than like lying or stealing or something when you're saying they're all sins but how can you say that one is worse than another when God does say that no sin is greater? 
Yeah, well, because I think that when we, t when, we, when we talk about repentance, there are a couple of ways. Good question, by the way, and I did not even hear your voice shake, so that you were nervous, I could not tell. Um, sin is an, a really profound category, and in some ways, sin is a category that only makes sense in the context of a holy God. Right? I mean, apart from, a, and I'll tell you what, I am not holy, in case you haven't figured that out. Right? So I have absolutely no right and no business to, in, in my opinion, to be offended by your sin. Whatever that is. Because guess what? I'm not holy. I am not holy. The, the question of, of, of sin becomes powerful because of the presence of a holy God. And one of the ways that we get to know the character of sin is in the doctrine of repentance. Which is a gift from God, not something that we can manufacture. So how did we create, how did we get to a world where a particular sin became the worst of all sins? I think it's because we're a bunch of sinners and it's so much easier to poke at other people's sin and not our own. Okay, I, I think that our job is to love the sinner, hate our own sin. I do not think our job is to love the sinner, hate the sin. I think if we spent more time hating our own sin, uh, you know, we would just be more responsible with the lives of others. But I don't think that means that we should be unclear about what God calls sin. God calls any heart that is unsubmitted to the Lord Jesus Christ sin. What happens to your body after that is up to him. But you know what? It's the heart that matters. And we need to be better keepers of each other's the integrity of each other's hearts. Okay, who's, I don't know who's on first, who's on second. All right, you, hi. Yeah. Good evening, doctor, and thank you for your time. Um, I just wanted a, somewhat of a clarification. You spoke earlier about the um, inerrancy of, this, of the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think in a previous question, you, you, in regards to slavery, you were saying that the Bible got it wrong. I just wanted some clarification no. yeah, yeah, on yeah. that. No, uh, what I said, what I meant to say, what I meant to say is that those, you know, thus saith the Lord, those who are wielding up the scripture as a proof text got it wrong. The example of chattel slavery in the Old Testament was not an example to be emulated. It was not something that was honoring to God. And the example of slavery in the New Testament was a particular, it was not chattel slavery. It had to do with, with basically with Roman citizenship. And so I am not saying that the Bible got it wrong. I'm saying those of us who wield the Bible and say, thus saith the Lord, got it wrong. The sin is on us, not on God. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah, and you're I think basically you saying it's the, script, the sinner, not the scripture type thing. Uh, that's right. Okay. That's right. All right. Um, thank you, doctor, for coming to speak with us. Um, I just want to talk more about uh, maybe the culture of conservatism and a lot of people here have been talking about the importance of the LGBT community and communication with uh, Christians. I'm a practicing Catholic so I'm um, almost more the very conservative on this issue but the catechism of the Catholic Church even says when it comes to homosexuality all references of unjust action should be avoided at all, at all cost. So do you think when it comes to economic and legal um, inequality that we have a long way to go into furthering our um, dialogue with with these communities is so that people don't feel such hate and uh, discrimination yeah, yeah. No, as that, so many kids before have said. Sure, sure. You know, that's a, that's a great question and I think that's the kind of question that Christians need to, that's a, that's a conscience question. That's a, okay, I have sinned against you, what does my conscience tell me to do. And I, and, and I think that that is really yours to decide. One of, the, one of the things that I think about a lot is to look at scripture and look at some of its overriding principles. And one of the most important overriding principles is to be a good neighbor. And, you know, and we might disagree on how we apply that. So for many people in this room, uh, being a good neighbor would mean doing really anything that provides civil rights protections for all taxpaying citizens. And another one might say being a good neighbor means um, not ever instituting laws that might encourage people to be separate or distant um, from a holy God. But that is, like a lot of things in life, that is a matter of personal conscience and personal integrity, and I will respect your right 
to conclude that subject differently than me. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Butterfield. Hi. Uh, my name is Asia, and uh, my story is kind of similar to yours. Um, I dealt with same-sex attraction since I was like eight, and um, I just I have a question. Two, well, not two questions. I just want to address <laughs> two I don't issues. Give you two right, questions, yeah, only right? One. Exactly. But um, <laughs> I just want to to address two issues. Um, you mentioned something about struggling with same sex attraction. Um, I just wanted you to clarify what you meant by struggle, and also I wanted to know what your thoughts were on um, someone who is like considering that um, that their soul is at stake with something like this, like what would you say to them for like a starting place? Okay, okay. Well, let me just clarify the soul thing. Okay. If you are in Christ, your soul is good. Your soul is secure. And your loving, redeeming God will shepherd you from here to the end. And it's going to be messy, and it's not going to be fun, and growth and grace... We talk about growth and grace. Growth and grace happens in two directions. Um, one is we have greater and greater victory over our sin. And I think that's the one that gets a lot of face time in the Christian church. The other, just as important, is growth and humility when we realize that our sin is way bigger than we are. What, what God says to Cain in Genesis 4 is really important. God says... Sin lurks at your door. Its desire is for you, but you shall overcome it. Sin lurks and it has desire. There are a lot of young women here who are going to be walking home tonight alone, hoping that there is nothing lurking at that door desiring them, right? I was one of those. I understand. That's how scary, that's how, you know, that's really the image that we're supposed to have around the question of sin. So, um, you know, if sin was just a matter of knowing better or coming up with a political position or, you know, I, I think it's wrong, whatever, I think this is right, who cares? You know, sin is a big deal, a major enemy, a destroyer of, of, of uh, you know, it is why the creation groans. And we have to stop acting as though it's a matter of knowing better. You know what? If that's all sin is, then you don't need a savior who went to a cross and died an agonizing death. You need a 12-step program or a, you need some better apps on your phone so it'll, you know, like ring an alarm. I mean, you, you know, don't, don't tarry with the blood of God. So that, you know, the most important thing that you said is what about my soul? Sister, if you are in Christ, your soul is secure and, and it may be messy. Um, so struggle. You know, I don't, you know, struggle means struggle. Struggle means you wake up and um, I, think, I think Romans is a great book, you know, to go through, you know, the struggle. Romans 7 and 8, 6, 7 and 8. You know, Paul says, you know, why do I do what I don't want to do? Okay, you know what struggle is? Struggle is where you say, you know, I am not going to engage in internet pornography. And then after a 12-hour binge, you feel like crap. Okay? Uh, struggle is when you say, I am going to stop masturbating, this is really humiliating, and you know, there you are again. Mm -hmm. All right? I'm sorry, I know, I'm a pastor's wife, and I'm talking to you now about homosexuality, masturbation, and, and pornography, but you know what? These are important issues, and they make, they compromise us. So, that's, that's what I think. Your soul is good. If you're in Christ, your soul is good. All right, who's next? <clears throat> sorry, hello, my name's Tracy. Um, I was just wondering more so... Um, kind of to clarify about, you said that you kind of endeavored with men 22 to 28, and then after that, I'm sorry, am I heard well? Can yeah, you hear I, can hear oh, you. Okay. I can hear um, you. And then you endeavored into intense relationships with women. Um, do you think your background in feminist theory and queer theory at the time when you were, you know, in philosophical enlightenment and education, do you think that had to do with your sexuality as far as you know, uh, coining the fact that you were a lesbian and yeah. you're into lesbianism. Yeah. I mean, the way I you said know. that was just kind of weird. It sounded like a research paper, not a life. <laughs> so well, I was just wondering. I don't know. It, it, you know, I, I authored, co-authored the first domestic partnership policy at my university. My, my partner and I, I don't know. I mean, it felt like a life. It felt like a life. But you know what? I, I don't know. And, you know, that's the problem with using your personal experience. You know, ultimately... I want to respect your personal experience and I want you to respect the fact that, you know what? I don't know. I don't know. It really was not until I 
um, by God's grace, was able to step into God's story of my life, that I had any clarity on that at all. Okay, question over here. How you doing? Uh, nice beard. Um, I, <laughs> I, I just wanted to make an observation before I ask my question. Um, it's really encouraging that there's a room full of people and in this topic very diverse yeah, opinions. And there's just total peace here. I mean, we're, mm -hmm. we may not agree, but this is how we solve this problem. This is how we mm -hmm. get through this really messy time. I agree. It is just through open dialogue and respect. So it's encouraging right. to see. Yeah. Um, and I particularly was, was encouraged by those people that stood respectfully and protested. Mm -hmm. I thought, mm -hmm. what a great way to put across your message and be respectful mm -hmm. at the same time. That's so right. if any of you guys know those people, Tell them that was really cool. Um, so, <laughs> um, my question, I was sitting in the balcony, so I had to leave the theater to come down here. So if you've already had this question, pretend like it's the first time you heard it. OK, That'll absolutely. make me feel better. OK, I'll do that. Um, <laughs> I'll do that. As a Christian, I agree with Maybe you. Maybe my answer will get better the second <laughs> time. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, oddly enough, okay. um, we're going to circle back to something you said earlier. OK. Um, as a Christian, I, I, would, I would agree with you that the Bible is the inherent God-inspired word. And it, it's truthful and without any error. Mm -hmm. So could you go back to where you said the Bible got it wrong with regards to slavery? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Because as yeah. A, I don't think that's what you meant. And I no, know as I'm a sorry. believer, I, I cringed then, a little bit. Right. Like, Ooh, yeah, maybe I'm sorry. Then, then I misspoke. What I, what, what is, so, which people do, right? So we agree slavery is wrong, but could yeah, you maybe yeah, address yeah. that there, point? There are, two, there are two, in the Old Thanks. Testament, chattel slavery is used as an example of, um, of a particular practice during the uh, nation of Israel's um, growth. It was not ever meant to be an example of what to do. Why do I know that? Well, because if it's part of the judicial law, it is no longer relevant. Okay, the only part of the Old Testament that is relevant for application is the moral law. The ceremonial law went out with the old temple ceremonies because Jesus is our sacrifice. He is our perfect sacrifice. And the judicial law went out because we no longer have a, uh, you know, who, who are God's people? The gospel goes out to the whole nation. The gospel is not, uh, to the, you know, to all of the nations. The gospel is not in any way now contained to a people group, either based or organized um, by race or by nationality. Um, and and that's, that's really key, because that's what makes Christianity so different. You know, it's so different. Christianity doesn't say, this is how you can be saved. Christianity says, Jesus is the way. And you know what? There's a world of difference in that article adjective. Okay, there's a world of difference. It doesn't say pray five times a day, eat, you know, a vegetarian life. It doesn't, it doesn't give you, in some ways it doesn't really give you, uh, you know, as we said about conscience up there. There are, there are some clear things and then there are some, some matters of conscience. And that's important. And the, the importance of Jesus being the way is crucial because you know what? You can't do it on our own. I can't do it on our own. Just as Jesus had to bear a heavy cross, so do we. Um, and some people have a heavier cross to bear than others. And you know what? Maybe our brothers and sisters in Christ who struggle with same-sex attraction are really heroes of the faith and not people who need to be condemned or, um, or discouraged. You know, just a thought. Okay, just a thought. Um, so the the so but but definitely um, slave holding capitalist Christians got it wrong with slavery. And the passage in the New Testament, um, Ephesians six five, slaves be obedient to your masters. Uh, that is referring to a uh, civil category, not chattel slavery, but a civil category in first century Rome, which sadly, I hate to report to you, is very similar to the status of a student, where you have about four to six years to get it right. At the end, you may have citizenship, uh, or you just have to keep plugging along as you're, as you're plugging. Okay, so does that clarify? All right, next question. Hi, Rosaria. My name is Kathy, and I too hold a PhD in English from St. Louis University, which is a Jesuit school in St. Louis. And so uh, I nod to you for your use of poetry. It's one of my loves as well. I'm also a mother and a grandmother. I've been married for the last two years, have stepchildren and grandchildren. 
My question, though, uh, now that I look at my history, is that I'm an ordained pastor. Mm -hmm. And what saddened me, I did not expect to ask any question tonight, but what saddened my heart was to hear a question posed that suggested and even stated that gay people and Christians were not part of the same community, that Christians, whatever that meant to the questioner, could possibly love gay people better, but that they weren't part of the same family, the same community. And we're told in the New Testament that in Jesus Christ we are no longer male and female, we are no longer slave and free, we are no longer Jew and Greek, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. perhaps we are no longer gay and straight and bisexual mm -hmm. and transgender. Mm -hmm. My question to you is if you have the pastor's heart that I think I hear somewhere here, if you would join me in welcoming all these students and all the persons here into what the United Church of Christ calls the one body of Christ. Mm. It is our belief that Jesus Christ did not reject anyone. And we say to people, neither do we. And so I mm. ask you, mm. will you welcome people mm. in this incredible, radical mm. hospitality mm. that in the United Church of Christ mm -hmm. we call extravagant welcome. You brought up hospitality. Mm -hmm. I, do. I, I believe hospitality. we share that. Um, Thank you for the love that you exude in that, in that question. I, I did not hear the questioner, though, who asked me about, uh, it seemed to me that, that her question was about reconciliation. And I think that in order to be reconciled, you first have to acknowledge that there has been wrong. And so I heard the question, how can Christians love the LGBT community as a question that came from a heart that said, we need reconciliation. So I didn't hear her question the way you did, and I would just want to respectfully suggest that that might be another way of understanding that question. Now I will tell you that I have, um, I am not a pastor and I am an, an English professor by training and I like to tell people that I am not a theologian and, and neither was C.S. Lewis and that's sometimes a big shock to people. <laughs> you know? um, but I don't believe that it is a kindness to um, discourage people from full repentance. I do not. I do not. See, I, I believe and have experienced repentance unto life. And that is not the proof. Uh, the proof of the pudding is not that I'm married to a man. The proof of the pudding is that God has changed my heart. But the reality, I guess, of the pudding, see, this is why analogies are such a mess, right? The, 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 God asks us to give up all identity for the one singular identity of a soul rendered eternal one. And so that is why I cannot join with, um, with any uh, hermeneutical exegesis of the scripture that does not fundamentally uphold the whole uh, counsel and authority of God. All right, um, my name is Isla. I'm kind of nervous too, like the other girls, but. Uh, yeah, we're just gonna have to get over it. <laughs> it's gonna be better in the coffee shop, you know it. I am, um, I'm straight, but I definitely support our gay lesbian community. And I'm a student here at USF, and he ta we take a lot of pride in being diverse. Mm -hmm. And my question is, you've made a lot of comments saying, Jesus is the way. If your soul is with Jesus, you're in the right place. For me, I'm a Muslim, and here we have people from all different religions. Right. What do you say to us? Like, where's our soul? Like, personally, me, I'm from Bosnia. I came from a genocide mm -hmm. where, like, I had family killed. Like, what do you say to us? Where's our soul? We don't right. necessarily believe in Jesus. What do right. you have to say to us? Because we're right. so diverse here at USF. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm so glad. I'm so glad that you, that you mentioned that. Uh, whenever, and I think it's important to realize that for both uh, the Muslim faith and the Jewish faith and the Christian faith, in some ways, we all start in the same place, don't we? 
right? We start with one God. Is that right? Would you agree with that? Right, okay, but wait. Let me start. Let me start with the with the with with the with those who would who would who would appeal to the one the, the the Muslim faith, the Jewish faith, and the Christian faith. Start with the idea of of one God, uh, but then we we struggle the, the those three bodies with how to be fully honoring to that one God, and, and at least what has been helpful to me in my dialogue and my friendship with people who are Muslim and Jewish is to acknowledge that either our Muslim and Jewish friends have gotten it right and um, no Messiah has come yet. No Messiah has come yet. And then the true and the honorable way to, um, to, to revere God is to acknowledge that. Or the Christians have gotten it right and the Messiah came and he lived, and he suffered, and he sacrificed, and he, he, he bears sin upon him. He went to the cross. He died an agonizing death. He rose again in a physical, material way, and he sits at the right hand of God the Father. And the only way to honor God is through the living Messiah. So either the Christians have it right or we have it wrong. And either our brothers and sisters in the Muslim and Jewish faith have it right or they have it wrong. Now for the, for the other spiritualities, other religions, Hinduism, um, Buddhism, um, either there are a diversity of spirits and maybe it's okay to add Jesus you know, to that group? Um, maybe not. Okay, maybe we have that. But if we have a risen God, one true God, who indeed created us and redeems us, then that too would be a travesty. So it seems to me that as respectfully and as gently and as lovingly as we can, it makes sense to express what we truly believe and leave room for other people to disagree. My question to you, back to my favorite book, right? My question is if you've never read the Bible and you've never examined it, this is a great time in some ways to just answer that for once and for all. Up to you. I'm not your professor. I'm not. I'm. I, you know. I'd like to be your friend, but but maybe I'm not that either. It's just a suggestion. All right. Other questions. Two more. Okay. Oh wow. Oh yeah. Okay. Hi. Hi. How are you doing? Um, okay. So I was raised Catholic. Okay. Um, so but... was I. Okay. Cool. <laughs> um. <laughs> I'm named after the Rosary. You didn't know that. That's Rosaria. Awesome. Yes. Okay. Um, so. I'm not going to lie, in recent years I've had some, and by some I mean a lot, of questions about the Bible, but mm -hmm. you spoke earlier about interpreting it your own sort of way. Am I correct? Um, well, what I talked about is that you are responsible for reading it, interpreting it, and, right. and landing somewhere. Okay. That's right. I'm not responsible for how you do that. <laughs> right. Okay, so here's my question, because um, I want you to clarify something for me. So, sure. um, kind of how I interpret sin. I okay. guess. Um, let's say hypothetically there's a, I don't know, like a killer somewhere. And so directly and indirectly he is causing pain to lots of people around him within the community. Right. Um, sometimes it can go so far as to cause pain within your nation. Mm -hmm. Let's say he decides he wants to change his life. He goes to a church, finds God. Everything is cool. He's a different person. That is sin, correct? Do that's you want not the, my question. Do you want then. the Bible's definition of sin? That's not, that's not the Bible's definition of sin. The Bible doesn't start with a, a sort of sociologically mapped understanding of right and wrong. That's a sociologically mapped understanding of right and wrong. Okay. Not, not a bad thing. In fact, the fact that when we all get in our cars tonight and drive home and we run into a stop sign, I'm really hoping that you are going to bow to the sociological definitions of right and wrong found in that stop sign and stop your car. Right. But sin 
is, you know what, that, that, that definition of sin is about as, um, I mean, the, the, the vast difference is profound. But I think many people think of sin as kind of a wrong turn on the highway, which could also, by the way, if you're driving on the wrong, uh, you know, through a one-way street, that could cause some harm, or causing great offense to another person. Um, but no, that's actually not the Bible's definition of sin. Okay. But I'm glad you clarified, because, you know, if we start there, then obviously where we go with it won't, be, won't make very good sense. But what is the Bible's definition of sin? Is, is that, do, would you like me to answer that question? Um, actually, before you do, um, okay. kind of going along <laughs> with like, my interpretation. Like, oh, you know she's going to do which it. So just is wrong. let me get my question in before you run me over. It, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> pretty um, much. <laughs> I'm small, but I'm mighty, guys. I'm only 5'2, but I'm wearing my yoga pants for a reason. So, kind of have kind of how I've always interpreted sin. I've always been confused as to what the big deal about homosexuality is. Sure. Cause well, uh, I guess, if I guess, that's the definition, there is no big deal. Okay, well, I mean, yeah. but I guess my, my confusion comes with, like, I had a friend in high school who came out and was like, Jackson, I'm gay. And my reaction was, are we going to stand here or are we going to get lunch? Like, I, Yeah, right. So, but, right. but I, I guess my confusion lies with you sitting here talking about, earlier you said, there are many of you in this room who are right and many of you who are wrong. Who mm -hmm. are you to say that we're right or right. wrong? Right. That's well, that's, that's back to the question of conscience. And you need to read the Bible and you need to come to terms with the living God that made you and takes care of you. And I can't do that for you. But sin in the Bible is not a mistake. You know, it's not just taking the wrong turn in the highway or um, forgetting, I don't know, forgetting your good manners. Um, it, it was sin that brought death into the world. You know, under the, the covenant of life, which was the original covenant that, that God made with Adam and Eve, they were to live forever in a garden that was um, self-sustaining and beautiful and safe. And um, God had one rule, and it was a test, right? And the rule was do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the Satan, and, uh, Satan came in the form of a serpent and said to Eve, you know, did God really say? I mean, what's wrong with eating, you know, eating this? It's, it's good, it's beautiful to look at, and it will make you uh, like God. And then Eve ate, and you know what? It was pretty good, man. It was pretty good. And she gave some to Adam, and, and he ate. And then God said, what have you done? And Adam said, did Adam take responsibility for his sin? No. Did Adam say, I, I think, I think there are people who have a little bit of an edge on this, ladies. But you're right. In fact, he blamed God for his sin. And you know what? He did. What did he do? He said, the woman whom you gave... Come on, yeah. Okay. Okay. And you know what? We do that too. Now, you know what? I don't think Adam and Eve had any idea why that fruit was particularly bad, except for the fact that God said so. But Adam's response is really interesting, isn't it? Because that's what we do too. Okay. And you know, the Bible does say, when the Bible in the New Testament... Um, talks about anger. You know, it, it, it calls it, what does it call it? What's anger? Anybody know? It's murder. It's murder. You know, that's pretty, that's pretty intense. That's pretty intense. So, I, I think that if we don't have a right understanding of sin, we will never have a right understanding of the holy God who, who makes us and takes care of us. And we will never have, a, have an understanding of the loving grace through which he saves us and redeems us, in spite of who we really are. Okay. Well, I guess I have the last question. All right. So I was doing some research a little bit ago and realized that among animals, scientists have proven that over 1,500 species of animals actually do practice homosexuality. And I'm just wondering if 
Christians in general, or if you personally view that as a sin, because at the end of it, we're all animals too. Man, so that is so funny. If we're I, you, sinning, are the animals sure. sinning? I am, that is a great question. What is the difference between the creation of men and women and the creation of animals? And are we the same? Here's the difference. Animals can't sin. They cannot sin. Animals actually fulfill their creation mandate. You know, dogs are really good dogs, even when they pee in the house. That is not a sin, and God will not condemn them. You may be a little upset about that. Okay. But human beings are the only part of God's created order that are made in the image of God. And, and with that come some responsibilities. You have been a great audience, and I am so thankful that we have had this conversation. And I better, Luke, you better buy me a cup of coffee tomorrow morning if I'm really going to be here at 9 a.m., wherever you are. Okay, you let him know. But I'm going to turn this mic over to Jeff Lee, who will give us some closing remarks. Thank you. I know we're singling Luke out a lot tonight. Luke is a good friend of mine. He has challenged me as a pastor. He's challenged me in my views of the LGBT community, and I've promised him that when he comes, he gets an audience with Rosaria. So if you come and Luke is talking, you have to at least respect that, because he's a friend of mine, and I want to be true to my word to him. The other thing that I would like to uh, encourage you to remember, on the book table are copies of Rosaria's book and plenty of Bibles. Please don't leave empty-handed. Uh, please take one with you as you go out from here tonight. We know that there's still more questions, uh, and we are happy to meet with you. My contact information is on the bottom of that page. I'm not nearly as smart as Dr. Butterfield, but I would love uh, to get to together with you and to discuss these things further. So thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, be safe driving home. Thank you. Thank you.